This is my channel's weekly compendium, ending Monday, February 5th, 2024. Case file number 1453, written by Teddy Fluffy Cake Mix. When a hairdryer's cord defies logic. Hi everyone, I'm a bit of a skeptic, but I really can't figure out what happened. I feel I covered everything, but this still doesn't make sense. In our flat, I would dry my hair in the hall, as space-wise it made more sense, and I had a full-length mirror in there. I've always used the same hairdryer, never bought a new one. I'm someone with bangs, and a lot of bang wearers know that you have to style your bangs every day. So I wash my fringe and then blow dry it with my hairdryer every single day. I am standing up while I dry my hair, not sitting down. Normally, one day I came out of the bathroom, grabbed my hairdryer, and noticed I couldn't stand drying my hair as the cord was too short. I was confused as I've never moved that mirror and the socket is in the wall. Suddenly the cord was too short? When drying my hair I aim from above, suddenly that was impossible. I've tried everything to make it work but eventually I bought a new hairdryer as this one was useless as even when sitting in a small stool it would still be really hard to dry my hair. So the new hairdryer is the one I still use. The expensive nice old one is now in the drawer. I never was able to figure this one out, I don't get it. Bit of a lame glitch I guess, but it's very recent and even my boyfriend did not understand as he sees me dry my fringe every single day. It's not like a vague memory, this just happened and I have absolutely no way of doing my hair anymore with this thing. Anyone have fun logical explanations? Bonus file written by Timbuktian, The Mystery of the Empty Cabin. My family had a small cabin in the woods for spending weekends and holidays in. It was in a very deserted area in the countryside, and our only neighbor was a very old farmer who lived around 10 to 15 minutes walk away. The only other house was an abandoned old cabin that nobody had visited for decades. The owner died and the son never visited since. One weekend when I was about 14, I went to visit the cabin with my parents. My great aunt was there already, a few days earlier. She would go up there most weekends to enjoy the solitude and take care of the cabin. When we got there, she told us a very strange story. The local police got an emergency call from the cabin next door, the night before we arrived. But when the police finally got there, they found the cabin empty, except for a mug on the table with some water in it, and the phone lines had been cut. I remember this freaking me out and I never wanted to go near that cabin again. My great aunt is a pretty serious person, so I can't imagine she would make such a thing up. Bonus file written by Complete Rip 1447 A Priest, a Scapular, and a Family Tragedy. When I was 14, I was attending a religious conference with my Catholic school peers. It was far away, halfway across the country, so the only people I knew were the other kids from my school. It was the kind of conference where you could walk around campus and hear different people speak, attend panels, go to events, etc. But no cell phones were allowed, so you were essentially cut off from the world for the week. I was walking back by myself in the evening when a priest I had never seen before stopped in front of me, grabbed my hands, and just gave me a good creepy stare down. For a solid 15 seconds, he stood in front of me and just stared. Then he reached into his pocket and handed me a scapular. Now, if you're not religious, this is a protective necklace type deal that is supposed to protect someone who is dying, give them peace, a sign of salvation and a protection from danger. He put it in my hand, closed my fingers around it and walked away. I was dumbfounded, but put it in my backpack and didn't think about it again for the rest of the week. Never saw that priest again. When my parents picked me up from the airport after the conference, I could immediately sense something was wrong. They were very quiet and reserved and I could tell my mother had been crying. When we got to the car, they told me my grandfather had fallen off of his front porch steps while I was gone and was not recovering well. When I looked down at my backpack on the floor, I could see the scapular was in the side netting pocket right where I left it. He died within 24 hours of my return. Now I'm actually not a religious person and I don't think I've ever truly described the Catholic ideals I was taught, even as a kid. I was really just following the beliefs that were handed down to me. When other people talked about feeling God's presence, I never understood them nor did I know what they meant or had anything close to what they talked about experiencing when they prayed. 
but this experience is the only reason I cannot allow myself to be fully atheist. Thirteen years later and I still cannot piece this moment together to make it make sense. The priest could not have known me, his name tag was from Montana. I looked for connections in my group, went through all the teachers and students who attended and no one had a connection to any churches or priests in Montana. I don't believe in an almighty being up in the heavens deciding who gets eternal bliss and who suffers eternal damnation. But there has to be some kind of higher power. I don't know what it is and I don't have any further explanation but something was looking out for me that day. Case file number 1454 written by Androgynous Rain. From pizza into a triangle UFO. Saw an actual UFO. Not some fuzzy balloon in the sky, the real thing. This was in the 90s. Working late at a pizza joint, we close and the boss heads out back for a cigarette. He comes running in yelling for me to come see something a couple of minutes later, so I run out back. And there's this big triangle floating in the sky. It's drifting overhead at walking speed, and it's absolutely, completely silent. Eerily so. One blue light on each corner, no engines or sound at all. I should probably mention that my dad is a pilot, and I grew up at air shows. I'd seen all kinds of aircrafts, F-17s and B-12s in flight at close range. This wasn't any of those things. It wasn't a plane. Planes don't float by and stop motionless in mid-air a couple hundred feet up with no sounds. This thing did. My boss was kind of freaked out. So this triangle just leisurely drifts over us and then stops. Just hangs in the air motionless. You could have heard a pin drop. Two minutes go by. Then, with no change in orientation, this thing shoots up vertically about 10,000 feet in the blink of an eye, not so much as a noise. Then it accelerates faster than anything I've ever seen in the sky, far faster than an aircraft breaking the sound barrier and flashes into warp or whatever the frick and vanishes. Holy crap! Did we actually just see that? My boss exclaimed. Yeah, yes we did. And so did about 80 other people in town who called it in. Whatever it was, it didn't move, act, or sound like any airplane I've ever seen. Case file number 1455, written by Barbert Gnarly. The unexplained folded fleeced freakout. It's the middle of fall, about nine at night, a calm but crisp evening where you can see your breath. I live in an apartment complex and it's time to take my little 11 pound terrier for his last walk of the night. I put his harness on, his coat on, it's basically a cylinder open on both ends for the neck and hips, an extra hole for front legs and another very small hole around the shoulder blades for the harness clip to poke through and it velcros across the tummy and chest, and clip his leash onto the harness. We go downstairs and just outside the side exit is what used to be a tennis court, but now it's just grass and everyone uses it as a doggy area. The fence is still up and it's about 10 feet high, completely enclosing the area. The entrance is in the center of the closed long side. We get in, I close the gate, and my dog walks counterclockwise. I'm still holding his leash because it's dark out and he's dark, and along the far side there are branches from outside the fence that poke through and sometimes he'll just lay down under some of them. So we walk half the distance close the length way, we walk the right short side, we walk the back long side with the branches. We walk the left short side, he's doing the perimeter tonight. So there are trees further away on the outside of this left side as well, and beyond those trees is the street. The street lights are about 40 feet away, and the trees block most of the light, but a few streaks do reach the inside of the tennis court. We get to the close left corner and the light is hitting something brown with woolly fluff on it. I look a bit closer. Hey bud, that looks just like your jacket. I look at my dog. He's not wearing his jacket? What? I look closer in the grass, it's his jacket, neatly folded in half. I know this isn't crazy spectacular, but this is easily the single most confusing moment of my life. For a few minutes afterwards I felt queasy like I was going to throw up because I couldn't process what just happened. How did his jacket get outside the fence? And folded. Bonus file, written by Approaching77, The Supernatural Cocoa Plantation. When I was around 11 years old in the countryside, we went bird hunting often. One day, as I was preparing to go with an older friend, we were collecting marbles around the house. There's this tall tree stump standing in the cocoa plantation surrounding the house. 
about 150 feet away. It stood slightly higher than the cocoa trees and used to be home to many birds who made nests in it. The crown had broken off and it stood dead from the middle of the trunk to the root. We were having small talk as we gathered marbles. I stopped picking some marbles when he stopped responding to me. I stood up to see if he was there. Suddenly, a human-like face with very bright light radiating all around it sat on the stomp that was staring directly at me. I shivered and got frozen. I fully understood what I was seeing and was very much afraid. However, I could not take a step away from where I stood. He was already caught up in it, that's why he wasn't responding to me. This whole thing lasted about 30 seconds. When I regained control of my body, I turned around to see if there was anyone and saw no one. When I turned back to look at it, whatever was there was gone. There was no sign of it ever being there. I know I was not hallucinating because the other guy was staring back just as I was and I seemed frozen too. He stood a few feet to my right and ahead of me so I could see him while I was staring at the face. He regained control exactly when I did. We were both terrified afterwards. He looked at me with confusion on his face while I stared back hoping he would provide some explanation since he was older. He said nothing and I said nothing too. We both dropped the marbles we'd collected, went back inside and never spoke about it between us or to anyone. There's no way anyone would hear this story and not call us crazy. Besides, both of us were too confused and terrified at the same time we couldn't discuss it. Case file number 1456 written by ADHD Cowboy. An EMT's dream leads to a real life crisis. I don't know how I'm still alive. I've had quite a few close calls and brushes with death. Don't know if I'm lucky or God wants me around for a while longer. But more on the point of the question, when I was 19, I was fresh out of a job training for the National Guard. Following this, I took a class to get my EMT license in the downtime I had before starting college. I was asleep and having a dream. Side note, I'd been having a lot of dreams and nightmares at the time. This dream was me and my partner going to a guy's shop and about all I remember is leaving and thinking, man, I hope that guy will be okay. Then boom. Big as hell explosion that sounded a little too realistic and thus realizing I'm in a dream, I wake myself up to look at my watch, 4.30 a.m. on the dot, grab a gun and run out to the living room. My dad is still sound asleep and I wake him up asking if he heard an explosion, thinking maybe a neighbor's farming equipment blew up or something. He says no. I go outside and don't see anything burning or a glow from anything burning, so I go back to my bed thinking it was a surreal dream. Later that day, I visited my mom at work and she told me that a body shop in a town 30 miles away from the house blew up when the owner lit the propane heater and he was pretty messed up. Perplexed, I asked what time it happened and she says it was 4.30 that morning. I'm floored because there's no way I should have heard that from that far away, 30 miles. Especially not when my dad didn't hear it as well, he sleeps lighter than I do. I still wonder about that to this day and I've asked a lot of people about their opinions and no one has a good guess beyond coincidence. The second story. I used to work at a hospital doing security work and one day in rounding in the newest part of the hospital on the top floor or roof, maintenance stuff and AC units was up there with my friend and coworker, and we both heard a cat meowing. Wasn't my friend as we were next to each other and we heard it a good ways down the hall. There's definitely no one else around and no way for a cat to get up there to my knowledge. Never found it, but we weren't the last ones to hear it. Case file number 1457, written by Ananto Arialana, Vanishing in the Mountains. I live deep in the mountain countryside, so activity was low small town. The area has massive field mountain walking paths and a few road and walking paths around a small train station, a metal factory, and the tiny town where I lived. I was walking alone in the fields for a day walk and I passed by two women. The directions we were walking in are theoretically impossible to come back around to in time to cross each other quickly. So I enter a concrete walk path, no one even around, by the factory three minutes in and who do I see? The same woman. Both of them. I casually said hello, but then it clicked. I've seen them before. I turned and they were gone around the corner, but damn it, I've never turned so fast in my life. Never saw those women again, never. In the few years I've lived there, I've seen them only that day. 
I went out for walks every single day, so I had a good probability of seeing them again, and yet I never did. Never spoke of it until here. This wasn't at night, this was in clear daylight. Case file number 1458, written by D615, the mysterious lady in a luxe boutique. I live in the USA. My sister and mother were in my home country. My mother passed away and my sister went to this new Lux department store to buy some morning clothes. Now, my sister is extremely particular about shirts and tops and only likes the ones my mom used to buy for her 35 years ago on overseas trips. My sister asked the sales staff whether they have any tops in specific color. Then a customer my sister had never seen before, someone who looked just like a younger version of my mom, had suddenly appeared in my sister's side reached out into the racks and pulled out two tops in the exact color, fabric, and size my sister likes. Then she said something that my mom always used to tell my sister when getting ready for an event. My sister described this customer to me as looking like a younger version of my mom with the 50s hairdo we've only seen in photos. My sister and I were born in the 60s, when my mom had longer hair, which she put up into a beehive do. By this time, I was on my way back to my home country. After the funeral, I visited the shop once my sister and once by myself, and could not find tops like that. They usually have items in multiple sizes. When I went with my sister, she insisted we could leave from the service elevator in the back. I was just as insistent that we couldn't because of high security. She told me that the lady who had helped her left from the back entrance. When I went there by myself, I spoke with the manager who called the five sales clerks to help find another of the tops. I even showed them a photo of my sister in one of the tops that she had bought only a few days ago, but none of them remembered having the item. Summary A lady who looked and spoke like a younger version of my mom found the exact kind of clothing item my mom used to buy her on overseas trips 35 years ago for my sister in her exact size and had seemingly vanished through an extremely high security area. So this stranger, who looked just like a younger version of my mom, down to her 1950s hairdo style we've only seen in photos, reached into the racks of a luxe contemporary department store and pulled out two tops that fit my notoriously hard to please sister perfectly. And no, it's not a resurgent style because there were no other items like that around. Case file number 1459, written by C. Jane Go, The Mind-Blowing Cat Conspiracy. Last night after dinner, my partner, I'll call him H, went back into the kitchen for something and observed Luna, our black cat, sitting on the little red stool that I put in the kitchen in front of the French doors a few days ago so the cats can look out. We have red curtains flanking those doors and the curtains were pulled closed, providing a contrasting backdrop for Luna, who was on the stool. He said, Luna is on the stool and he shows up well with the red curtains behind him. I'm always talking about how I can't take good photos of Luna because he's black and you can never see him well. It was just a passing comment and I made a mental note to take a photo of him sometime in that spot. So H comes back to join me on the sofa. We chat for about 10 to 15 minutes or so and he gets up to go back to the kitchen. He said, Luna's still in here on the stool. I told him that it was weird that he'd just be hanging out by himself in a dark closed off kitchen. Normally, he'd be with us wherever we are. It wasn't like he had anything to look at outside. The curtains were closed due to the cold drafts. I tried to reason out that weird behavior, but cats do weird things, so I didn't think much of it. I told H that he's probably just waiting for a treat. I had been giving the cats treats every night for the last three nights or so, so that kind of made sense. As H was leaving the kitchen, he tried calling for Luna to come out, but he didn't. I tried calling too from the sofa. By the way, you can't see the kitchen door and stool where Luna was from our sofa in the living room. As H was walking out of the kitchen and through the dining room towards the sofa again, we were talking about how Luna knows the words treat and that I have to spell it out so he doesn't get worked up. He suggested that I call out that I have a treat so that maybe he'd come out of the dark kitchen and join us in the living room. I told him that if I did that, he'd have to actually get up and go get a treat from the kitchen when he came out. I was being lazy. But ultimately, we decided to test the little experiment. By this time, H had joined me back on the sofa. There is a chair next to the sofa where our blonde cat, Sol, was snoozing away on a cozy black blanket through all of this. 
I noted that I wasn't sure if Saul knew the word treat, as well as Luna, and said that it would be interesting to see how Saul responds. I start saying at first in a softer voice, Anybody want a treat? Still no Luna emerging from the kitchen. So I said it again a little louder. We looked over at Saul, and he was slowly opening up his sleepy little eyes, but still no Luna. I said it again two or three times, and all the while we were glancing between Saul and towards the dark kitchen entry, watching to see if Luna would come out. And then, when I was looking at Saul, whose head was completely raised at this point, I see right beside him another pair of green eyes, and quickly realize, we actually both realize at the same time, that Luna was curled up on the chair with Saul? And when I say curled up, it was like kind of curled up therein when cats are in total relaxation or nap mode. I'm not sure about other people who have cat siblings, but with my cats, if they end up napping together, it usually starts with one cat already asleep, usually Saul, then the other will jump up on them and start cleaning them, licking their ears and faces. Then one or two things will happen. They either start to play fight until it turns serious-ish, in which case I have to scold them because usually the napping cat just isn't in the mood to play fight, or on rare occasions, the imposing cat just cleans his brother and then curls up and sleeps right next to him. It is never just a cat jumps up on the other and just goes to sleep or in chill mode. It's always a process. <laughs> I know because I always have to keep an eye on them when one jumps on the other in case one, usually Luna, starts bullying the other, biting too hard and so on. So this means at some point between H leaving the kitchen the second time, when H observed Luna still on the stool, and coming to the sofa, Luna would have to have had darted out really quickly without us noticing and then ran straight to the chair his brother was in, all within full view of where we both were, and settled down right away without waking his brother up. That is just not the way Luna operates. He doesn't dart through the house unless on rare occasions he's playing with his brother and they have the zoomies. Otherwise, Luna lumbers. He's a lumberjack. That's why his nickname is Luna Bear. He looks and lumbers like a small black bear. And what's more, I had called out, anybody want a treat? And treat, treat, several, several times. Ordinarily, when treat time is announced, he always comes running into the room. Always the kitchen, except for last night, when we were trying to learn from the kitchen. Meowing like crazy and acting like he's dying or going through a withdrawal and just needs a hit of that life-saving cat treat. It's a running joke that the food and treats are one of the rare things that he'll actually run up for. But he was just sitting there on the chair curled up next to his brother looking at me like, what are you going on about? We were, are, so baffled. H and I looked at each other like, what the hell just happened? He immediately went back to the kitchen where he just was and there was no Luna on the stool because Luna was apparently on the chair next to us. I don't even know, but damn. Case file number 1460, written by Boobly Skunk Nugget, the songbird that saved my soul. When I was in my late teens, my father ended his life. One of the things I best remember him for was his enormous love for birds, especially those small songbirds. He had loved them since he was a child. His favorite sound was birds singing, and even one of his favorite songs was about a small bird, specifically about a young girl asking the bird to send a forget-me-not flower to her father up in heaven. I have always struggled with mental health issues, and although he struggled a lot himself, on my bad days, he would always sit by my side, just sitting silently next to me to support me the best way he was able to, until I managed to calm back down. After my father's death, my mental health plummeted, to the point where I no longer had any will to live. I was sent to a mental institution to be watched over. The thing about these rooms is that the only window that is openable is a teensy tiny window, and when opened it's barely even big enough to fit your hand through on its own. But all the windows had bars in front of them, including a bar going in front of the tiny one, making the opening even smaller. During this stay, I got really really bad. I was lying on the bed, crying, forming a plan of how I would finally get peace, when I saw a shadow. I looked up only to see on the back of my chair a little songbird looking at me. It just stood there, looked around the room a little and then looked at me again. I managed to calm down and breathe and when I felt better, I had to take a picture of it because I was wondering if I had lost my mind. After I took the picture and checked it out, when I looked back up, the bird was gone. I am not a religious or spiritual person, 
but that encounter felt too specific to be a normal coincidence. Although, that is probably what it is, thinking about it logically. Still, to this day, whenever I have anxiety or feel depressed, I think about that bird, and it helps me feel calm again. Bonus file, written by Duad4408. Demon faces the fury of our fearless Rottweiler spirit. My wife and I had a huge Rottweiler we raised from a puppy when we started dating. He was a huge butthole, fiercely protective over both of us, especially my wife, and very picky about who he was friends with. Definitely our fault. He was an under-socialized COVID child, and we didn't have very many friends at our jobs or otherwise. He did love us more than anything on earth, and was the most loyal dog we could have asked for. I used to joke with my wife that if someone dared to break into the house in the middle of the night, they wouldn't have made it past the living room with all their limbs. Our dog died at two years old, from random heat exhaustion. Took him for the same 20 minute walk we did every day. He never made it home. My wife and I were shocked and devastated, especially her. We wasted no time getting another puppy with the house being so quiet. Once again, a little German Rottweiler. The two dogs couldn't have been more different. While protective, our current dog is the friendliest little bastard you could ask for. We made an effort to not repeat the same mistakes we did with the first pup and got him very well socialized and adapted at a very young age. Fast forward to last night. I am a long time sufferer of sleep paralysis. I've seen every demon possible in my room at some point in my life, the infamous hat man. He stands in the corner and smiles, sometimes reaches out and touches my legs on the bed. Having been through this so many times, I've gotten pretty decent at snapping out of it, albeit with some good effort. Last night was a lot different. It started off with him in the corner as usual. I started doing my usual strategies, wiggle my toes, say a prayer, etc. But nothing snaps me out of it. Eventually, the hat man gets on all fours and shuffles on top of me from the corner. At this point, I'm completely overcome with terror. I've never seen him this close before. His face is a few feet from mine, his black cartoonish eyes staring into me with his dark toothless grin unwavering. I repeat my strategies, trying to break out to no avail. Suddenly, piercing through the low humming noises, I hear a very deep guttural growl coming from next to me where my wife is sleeping. I use all the effort I can to wiggle my eyes in that direction. Standing over my wife, looking dead at my demon, is the angriest looking Rottweiler I have ever seen. Teeth are bared, hackles up, letting loose a furious snarl. I thought maybe it was my current dog, and that I have perhaps managed to snap out of the paralysis, until I saw the dock tail. The current dog has a full tail, the old one didn't. The dog launched itself into the demon still on top of me, staring into my soul, which somehow woke me up finally. I immediately teared up and went to the closet, where we still kept his favorite stuffed animal the only one he never destroyed, and just sat there holding it for a while, thanking my mean, nasty, fiercely loyal baby boy for continuing to protect us late into the night in this life and the next. Quesantes file 1453 When a hairdryer's cord defies logic This one is hard to place. I don't think it can be quantum immortality because there'd be no reason the you in a different universe would have a hairdryer that she couldn't use either due to such a short cord. I'm really not sure. Maybe instead of a DOP event, disappearing object phenomena, it's MOP, morphing object phenomena. Somehow, the length of the cord actually morphed to be shorter. I suppose if objects can disappear, they could change their properties as well, spontaneously. Quesantes for the bonus file. The mystery of the empty cabin. The mug of water is disturbing to me. Of all the details in this, it's the most disturbing aspect. I'm not even sure why. Does anyone else feel that way? I mean, it could have just been a person that broke in to this abandoned cabin and was drinking and then left, but I don't know, it feels weird to me. Of course, the line's being cut. Did he call with a cell phone? It's very odd. Quesantes for the bonus file. A priest, a scapular, and a family tragedy. I'm right there with you. I don't think any particular religion describes what the creator would be like or what life after all quantum immortality deaths are exhausted would be like. But especially with all the stories I've read at this point, that I do believe there is something else out there that is currently beyond what we can observe. It's hard to deny that. There's just too many anomalies going on that I can't see fitting in 
neatly without some force beyond the universe having a role. And now time for the joke of the day. A woman in labor suddenly shouted, Shouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't, didn't, can't. Don't worry, the doc said. Those are just contractions. This is like a joke that Data would make on Star Trek TNG. You can't use contractions. <laughs> uh, well, these words are less painful than the real thing. That's a bonus. <laughs> Quesson Sofa, 1454. From pizza into a triangle UFO. Triangle-shaped UFOs appear most common in the reports I can find. But I think there are multiple design types, perhaps from different species. Why does it have to just be one species of alien, right? There could be more than one. The technology of these crafts strikes the biggest hit in my brain because it makes the story nevertheless incredible, even if it turns out to just be advanced military aircraft. For instance, to rise thousands of feet in a second, if that, with no sound. By our current laws of physics, this is impossible. First off, from the compression of the air creating a sonic boom, you'd hear that instantly. And secondly, the g-forces accelerating that fast would rip apart any ship constructed from any known materials instantly. It would just disintegrate, basically. So whatever tech is involved is capable of nullifying how we understand the current laws of physics, which is absolutely thrilling to me. There's so much yet to learn. If it's something the military already learned, or other aliens, it's still out there. We're ready to be discovered. Case notes file 1455. The Unexplained Folded Fleece Freakout A DOP event caught almost directly in view. At some point in that walk, his jacket popped off, faced through the fence, and went out for its own walk. There is no explanation outside of a glitch in the Matrix. This simulation bugged out, or some divine force acting upon it to first remove it and then transport it without even being seen. That's incredible. It's almost like the memory of it happening was erased. Case notes for the bonus file. The Supernatural Cocoa Plantation. I wonder if spirits can concentrate their aura into a visual spectrum to appear so bright in one area, like their face. But if so, what was the goal here? Very weird. And now time for the joke of the day. Hear about the new restaurant called Karma? There's no menu. You just get what you deserve. I wonder what I would get. Maybe some candy? Hmm, I'm pretty sweet. Yeah. Que sont 1456. An EMT's dream leads to a real-life crisis. The subconscious human mind is aware of so much more than is fed into the conscious mind. It's curious. We can ask the question, what force decides what the subconscious is allowed to feed into the conscious self-aware self? What is directing that? Is it just pure quantum chaos that decides, or is there some other force acting upon it, like a soul? Makes you wonder. Que sont 1457. Vanishing in the mountains. That you never saw them again means they weren't rooted in that place in time. I'm guessing the trail has existed for a while, deeper in the past, and they were traveling on it, walking normally, in the past, and then you saw their echo in the future. Another echo in time. Que sont 1458. The Mysterious Lady in a Luxe Boutique Remember, soul projection isn't limited to the current timeline. Your mom, probably in a dream as perceived by her when it happened, did indeed help your sister with her outfit. Explains a style persisting into her future too and disappearing from a highly guarded exit that she couldn't have disappeared or exited from if she was just a normal person. It's rather sweet, isn't it? And now time for the quote of the day. Insane people are always sure that they are fine. It is only the sane people who are willing to admit that they are crazy. Nora Ephron. Well, it's that other saying of, you're probably not crazy if you ask yourself the question of, am I crazy? Because there's introspection going on there that a crazy person probably isn't going to have. I don't know if it's true in all cases, but it makes sense to me. So I'll just keep asking, am I crazy? <laughs> Maybe that in of itself is crazy. I don't know. The mind is a weird thing. By the way, if you want a psychological thriller, I recommend the show Chance on Hulu. It's pretty interesting. It's uh, with Hugh Laurie in it, and he's a neuropsychiatrist. He recommends people to psychologists to help them. But he gets wrapped, roped into this weird, uh, abusive mystery with one of his patients. Anyways, I don't want to spoil anything, so go give it a watch if you're into that. Okay, so it's a file 1459. The Mind-Blowing Cat Conspiracy. Mind-blowing is a fair assessment, I would say. And yeah, there's no way you wouldn't have heard Luna moving as you describe so quickly. 
and being with their brother, even if, for some reason, Luna just went to her brother, napping together, and never fought, you would have heard the cat rushing in from the kitchen. Is it just pet teleportation? Maybe. Something along those lines does seem to happen often. And I wonder, maybe teleportation is only possible for placeholders. That is to say, pets and maybe insects and humans that don't have a soul. They're just creations of the simulation. Whereas some people and some animals really do have souls. They are animated. Everyone else is just a placeholder. Like in a video game where there's NPCs and real players in an MMO. Only much more complex and realistic. And now time for the fact of the day. Honey never spoils. Archaeologists have found pots of honey in ancient Egyptian tombs that are over 3,000 years old and still perfectly edible. The long shelf life of honey is due to its low moisture content and acidic pH. This creates an environment that inhibits the growth of microorganisms. I just thought that's pretty cool. And not just for prepper ideology or preparedness, right? Prepper preparedness. <laughs> But it makes sense to have food that lasts a long time. Even if it's just canned food, but honey is a sweetener that'll last a long time. Much more than sugar, I believe. But just a word of caution, if you buy honey in a supermarket, sometimes some of them are not actually honey. Or they're mixtures of honey and high fructose corn syrup or some other sweetening syrup that looks like honey but isn't honey. You can definitely tell it if you do a comparison. I think the Walmart Great Value brand is not real honey, so just keep that in mind. It's one of those cases where usually spending more money is worth it. And if you want a real treat, get the comb as well. Damn, it's so delicious. It's really like a natural candy bar. Case notes for file 1460. The songbird that saved my soul. This reminds me a lot of, and spoiler warning for Harry Potter. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it. But yeah, assuming you've seen it, spoiler warning. At the end, after Dumbledore is killed by Snape, I think it's in the book too, but in the movie, the characters go up to the top of the tower and they look up at this beautiful sunrise sky. And in the distance, you hear and see the phoenix that Dumbledore owned, or at least kept as a pet, singing. It's the songbird song, the melody of death. But it's kind of beautiful in a way. At any rate, I'm sorry for your loss. But it is beautiful to think that it's not a complete loss. Whatever the afterlife is, who we are, the ripple in the ocean that we are, never fades completely, or at least not immediately after death. And I find that beautiful. Case notes for the bonus file. Demon faces the fury of our fearless Rottweiler spirit. So I do believe that animals have souls, and if they do, they guard their owners, even after life. In their own death, their own hollowed out corner of the afterlife. They don't just vanish away. And we all know that dogs are fierce protectors. And you know this in real life too, even if the pet hasn't died, they're fiercely protective of their owner's grave if the owner dies, especially dogs. They will sit at the grave of their previous master and just offer it a guarding. Almost like how we guard the veterans memorials with the actual human guard there. Ours is a bit more calibrated, but hey, <laughs> the spirit and the intent is what counts. It also makes me wonder, sleep paralysis might actually reveal that the demons we see are only accessible in this dreamlight state, but they really exist. If your spirit dog defended you from it, well, it wasn't just defending you from a figment created by your own imagination, no. It really was there. Maybe they can only be accessed or visible when you're in that dreamlike state. And now to lighten the mood, the joke of the day. A man goes to the circus. After the show, he speaks to the manager and asks for a job. All right, what can you do? The manager asks. I can do great bird impressions, the man replies. Psh, a lot of people can do that. Oh well, the man says and flies away. <laughs> I guess that's a pretty good bird impression. I would uh, concur with that. <laughs> Was he like flapping his wings or did he have like Superman flight where he can just hover? I'd prefer the hovering aspect, like using your body's energy to levitate. Either way, being able to fly would be awesome. I don't think I would join a circus if I had that power. There's probably more productive things you could do with that. Just saying. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.